So Elle, have you ever done anything like this before? Um, the first time that I was ever on camera, like a, like a broadcast of any kind, um, I was out bug collecting with my dad in these fields in Virginia. We were catching fireflies. And right as the news anchor was giving his overview, I come up from behind him and you see on the broadcast, you can see like the light shining off of my eyes. Because <laughs> at this point, I'm like two feet tall, right? So I just come up behind this guy, I jump up and I swing my bug net right over his head <laughs> while he's in the middle of a live broadcast. Wow. And that, that was my first experience with being broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like on the internet at all or anything? Yes, I think we have it saved in like our family videos. Mm. Um, we got a copy of it. Yeah, that seems like something that would totally go viral, you know? Definitely. <laughs> Let's just like introduce ourselves, give our name and pronouns. Um, yeah, we can go from there. All right. I am L, like the letter, uh, and I use my right hand. My pronouns are she, they. Sweet. Yeah, my name's Willow. I also use she, they. Um, she, they gang. She, they gang. <laughs> um, yeah, do you want to talk about like how you like your name? Because your name is so interesting, the way that like mm. you do the L with everyone. <laughs> Okay, so my dead name is Eli, and I'm okay with everybody knowing that. Uh, doesn't bother me that mm -hmm. much. Um, and you probably noticed, it's one letter off <laughs> from my current name. So I did that because uh, when I came out to my parents and decided to change my name, they were really sad because they had spent a lot of time picking out my name. Uh, so I decided to uh, pick something that was close to what they picked for me. So compromise. that they, yeah. yeah, like a compromise or a consolation. <laughs> That's how I got my, my current name. I also, it was also just like a shortening of my name because I wanted to, I wanted to make it feel like a nickname so that if anybody ever used my real name around somebody who I wasn't out to, it would be, um, it isn't an immediate giveaway. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really well thought out name. Yeah. I'm very impressed I, by that. <laughs> I mean, I had, there was a huge period of time where I was out to myself, yeah. but not out to anyone. So mm -hmm. I had plenty of time to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> what was that like when you were like out to yourself, but not to anyone else? Um, it was, it was really a journey because I think it was, if I made a chart of how sure I was <laughs> over my lifetime, it would probably be a bump and then a dip and then a bump. Oh, interesting. What because, was the because when I was very little, I was very confident. And I was always <laughs> telling my parents, you know, I want to wear a dress too. And, and they, were, they just dismissed it as little kid things, which is reasonable. Little kids do weird things. Yeah. Um, and then, as I got older, uh, all of the gender norms kind of hit me at once oh. uh, as soon as I got into, like, first grade. Right. Uh, so I, I immediately overcorrected in the other direction. Mm -hmm. I think because I was afraid that people would, like, find out. Pick up on it. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was irrational, obviously, because nobody is going to see someone not playing football at recess and immediately <laughs> know that they're trans. <laughs> You're a girl, yeah. <laughs> You're a girl, admit it. <laughs> yeah. But I overcorrected immensely, <laughs> and I became the most manly man <laughs> that you ever did see in first grade. So I played football at recess with all of the boys all the time, and... Uh, just kind of hit it really deep. Um, and in those couple of years between like first and I would say fifth-ish grade, or maybe fourth, uh, I was like second guessing myself yeah. that this ever actually happened or was oh. a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's how you get that um, sort of, I was, I was really confident in my identity and then I backed off from it, and now I'm pretty confident in that. Yeah. How do you think you've gotten to like where you are now with the confidence in your identity? Mainly by having people... 
having people use your correct name and pronouns Mm -hmm. is very affirming and not in the way that you would immediately think. Because it's not like, it doesn't feel like everything up to that point has been wrong and this is finally right. It feels like, well, I guess I got it, didn't I? (laughs) <laughs> it was it was that, but since you are so used to people calling you the wrong thing, it is such a breath of fresh air that you immediately know that you're onto something. Using your name here and also people using your correct pronouns, like what is that? But like, because you're you become a regular really quickly. Like you're here oh all the yeah time. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's because I have no other, like <laughs> el- I have nothing else that I do. Uh, it was really affirming, but. Mostly because it was people outside of my normal circle mm-hmm. who were also uh, like caring about me and uh, doing that. Yeah. So, because I was used to, you know, people would use my correct name and pronouns at home and with my close friends, but as soon as I went out in public, it right. was, yeah. Um, so it was really affirming to have strangers this yeah so it was it was kind of a second bump in my confidence. I like that. so you're saying that your parents like use your correct pronouns what has that been like for you having supportive parents it sounds like it it has been a journey for <laughs> me and my parents uh when i first came out they weren't super supportive mostly because they i think because they just didn't really understand mm-hmm. and the best way i could describe it is they thought that it was all like a hobby oh interesting (laughs) like like they recognized that this was something that i was experiencing but they didn't recognize how important it was to me Mm. uh so they just they kind of lagged behind and um you know didn't use my correct name and pronouns for a while and i asked to do things like get my ears pierced and they gave the whole, you know, that's permanent argument. Like, yeah, I sure hope <laughs> it is. But then, uh, trigger warnings for suicide. I attempted suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, and this kind of shocked them into realizing that it wasn't all just a joke or a hobby. Yeah. This was who I was, and the denial of that was really hurting me. Um, So I got sent to the psych ward for Mm -hmm. a little bit, and when I came back, they were a lot better. Um, And and that's kind of how we get to where we are. Uh, So now they're they're pretty good with name and pronouns and stuff. Because, you know, they can recognize that. You living your true self is like is really the best way to support to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The the one thing that I would say is annoying about how they act now is they act like they never did anything wrong mm. in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like recognizing the hurt that was caused to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you were gonna say something and I interrupted. I'm oh. sorry. Do you want to introduce yourself? Because you haven't introduced yourself yet. Oh, I'm, I mean, this is all about you, right? But what do you want to know about me? <laughs> Just name and pronouns and stuff. Oh, Just yeah. for people. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Willow. I use she, they pronouns. Um, we're the she, the, she, they gang. Yeah. We've had you, like, at the home a lot lately. Um, and I've seen all of, like, all the chess competitions you've been doing with other people and destroying all of them. So. <laughs> but, like, the ratio. You've been, the like... The ratio <laughs> is pretty... <laughs> astounding yeah I would say (laughs) yeah so do you want to talk about like your interests what got you into like chess for example or even other things that you're passionate about for chess my dad got me into chess when I was pretty young and um I for a little bit I was really invested in it Mm -hmm. and I went to like competitions and stuff oh wow uh so I I was at one point the sixth best best chess player for my age group in the state but this was only because i was one of like seven third graders who knew how to play chess (laughs) in the entire state of utah (laughs) yeah so not exactly a herculean accomplishment but after that um i really 
dug my teeth into gymnastics, which mm. I had, uh, which I had also been doing this whole time. And the chess tournament season and the gymnastics tournament season are the same season. And they usually fall on like the same Saturdays. So I had to give up one or the other. Uh, and I chose chess because my sister was in gymnastics and uh, it was kind of a family tradition at that point. <laughs> uh, but then I got back into it about a year ago and I've been going strong ever since. What do you like about chess? I like that there is no hidden information. Mm. There's nothing left up to the... There's nothing left up to randomness. Mm -hmm. It's all about you. And you, you are always in control of everything that's happening on your side of the board. I like that. That's like almost applicable to your identity, like yes. being in control of it. It's a great metaphor. Uh -huh. yeah. And then some other things that I'm passionate about are uh, biology, mm -hmm. which comes from both of my parents being biologists. Uh, so my mom is a herpetologist, which is study of reptiles and amphibians. And um, my dad is an entomologist, which is insects and arachnids. Uh, cool. So I, my parents study the two things that people are afraid of in nature, snakes and spiders. I love that. <laughs> and so they've kind of instilled their love of biology onto me. And my specific field is um, plants. I, I really like plants, specifically fungi, because mm. they're so interesting and they break so many rules of conventional biology and classification. <laughs> That's so interesting. Is that like what you want to do career-wise? I think so. Yeah. Being a mycologist, which is a study of fungi, is I think where I want to end up. Mm -hmm. I think my my dream job is being a professor of mycology. Oh wow. Uh, I could totally see you being a professor. Yeah. <laughs> just just because I would love to be I would love to be like a good influence yeah. on my students because it's it's so hard to get like good teachers who are really passionate about the subject Absolutely. that they're in. So I would, so there's kind of like a double, <laughs> I, I really want to be doing biology and I also really want to help students. Do you have any other like big life goals that like things you want to do in your life? Uh, leave the US. Hmm. That is, that is one of my top priorities. Have you been outside the US at all? I have technic well I've I've been out the U I I've been outside of the US twice. The first time was only technically when me <laughs> and my family went to see Niagara Falls. So not the most exotic, but technically. Yeah. yeah. And then I went on a short sabbatical with my dad to Vanuatu, which is a oh. series of islands in between New Zealand and um Australia. Forgot wow. the name there for a second. <laughs> That's super cool. Did, yeah. What like, what did that mean to you? Like going outside of the country, seeing other places to live, and it was really interesting. Mostly because all of the people there were so much nicer <laughs> than everybody here. Um, and I think that's just like Polynesian island culture. Yeah. We would have people who we would like bump into on the street and they would invite us into their home for dinner. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, would uh, you want to live there? I'm not sure. Mm. It ha it's it's still kind of blossoming because the US had a had a naval base on one of the islands there and they're still kind of recovering oh, from no. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, the US um, it's just a fun fact when they were done with their naval base after World War II, and instead of bringing all of their equipment back, they realized that it would actually take more money in fuel uh, to get back to the U.S. harbors mm -hmm. than it would to just sink them and lose everything on them. Wow. So they sank <laughs> all of their ships and crushed all of the coral reefs on, like, one side of this one island. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. So now... It is like a destination for people who wanna who wanna uh, dive and see like shipwrecks mm. because there are like five shipwrecks within this one uh, island coast. Wow, that's an unfortunate decision, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And now they're actually dredging them back up because there's now demand for pre World War II manufactured oh. steel. 
So now they can make money off of it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and that's for, <laughs> that's for scientific instruments because ever since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there is a higher level of radiation in the air. So when they pump air through iron to instill carbon and make steel, they actually instill permanent radiation, which messes up Geiger counters. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so there's now like a market for steel that was manufactured before the end of World War II. That's so interesting. Yeah, just <laughs> random fact from up here. No, yeah, no, I love all the random facts. You always have so many. <laughs> I it's know. Like stuff I didn't even know about at yeah. all. Yeah. 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 Is that like, do you just like do research in your free time? I like to read academic papers occasionally, mm. uh, just because I think they're interesting and they go really into depth, which is something that I can always appreciate. Um, and and they, they have to be on topics that I like, mm -hmm. but I guess that's kind of abnormal, and that's where I get all of these little tidbits <laughs> uh, yeah. from across different, different fields. Have you read any cool papers about like being uh, queer or like any or, or just cool papers in general? Well, cool papers about being queer. I read um, a study that was looking for the quote unquote like queer gene. And they found that there is an undisputable connection between um, heredity and hmm. queerness. So they did like blind twin studies um, where the, the twins weren't blind. This is. Uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, I get you. <laughs> yeah, these are twin studies where when one of the twins comes out as queer, they basically find the probability that the other twin oh. is also queer. And it's pretty close. And it's. It is much higher than the than the the average. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So this is so this is the beginnings of finding biological. the sort of biological queer gene. I like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's obviously not one gene. There isn't even like a height gene. Right. It's it's all very complex <laughs> interlocking systems. Yeah. But we can tell that it is hereditary. Hmm. I like that. That kind of helps bring us one step closer to kind of. Validity. Breaking a lot of those yeah. stigmas and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's like the biggest stigma that you feel like you face? Hard to choose. <laughs> but as a trans feminine person, mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of very specific prejudices just right there in that very specific niche. Yeah. Um, like... It's hard to give specific examples. Because it's the whole experience. It is the whole experience. Yeah. Um, it's the concept, I, I think the most tr troubling is probably the concept of uh, like trans women like baiting straight men mm -hmm. by not immediately telling them that they are trans. Yeah. Uh, that whole that whole area is just a quagmire of yeah <laughs> yeah i get you yeah what does it mean to you to like be a trans woman um or i guess at your age a trans girl it feels really isolating mm -hmm. honestly um because you don't realize from the outside how very focused a lot of bigotry against the queer community is at trans feminine people yeah a lot of the bigotry coming from outside of the community is very laser focused on trans on women. on trans feminine people and in specific young trans feminine people yeah uh so the whole bathroom bill situation uh is that's just kind of, uh, it's, it's very isolating because everybody who's against you recognizes your identity in very specific terms and very specifically rejects it. Yeah. So it's not the rejection of the entire queer community. It's the, it's the rejection of your specific identity, yeah. which I think stings a little bit more. I can see how that would be like really isolating. Yeah. What to you, I guess a question I want to ask is like, how would you envision like a perfect world for not only you, but you know, other trans femme women? I think I would take a page 
out of one of my favorite um, books that I've ever read, which is a kind of future sci-fi fantasy thing. And in it, there is one sector of the world where gender is not recognized mm. as a concept. So they explain it in, in like detail. It is um, when children are like seven, they are allowed to choose their own gendered or non-gendered pronouns and name. Uh, and it's just completely decoupled from biology. Mm. Because I think then it would be a universal experience, c coming out would be, um, and so it wouldn't be as isolating yeah. to be different from the norm. Yeah, because yeah. I've, I've heard people talk about, you know, like, wanting to live in a non-gendered world, but I like that that's the concept of, like, people kind of choose at that age yeah. if they want to come out, or uh -huh. not even if they want to come out, it sounds like they come out. Yeah, Yeah. Just, just because no matter how accepting we make the world, it will always feel at to some degree isolating to have to come out as deviating from the norm. And the only way that we can fix that is to break the norm entirely. Very well said. Yeah. Inspirational. <laughs> so like talking about breaking the norm, like what inspirations have you had in your life that make you want to live the life that you want to live? Someone that I discovered far into my transition is, um, was a bisexual woman who lived in uh, 1600s England and because of very specific circumstances regarding the king and his gay brother, he couldn't crack down on and, and put in place like anti-gay legislation. So she was part of his royal court and was openly bisexual at a time where that was completely unheard of in the 1600s wow in the yeah in the 1600s <laughs> and so she would cross dress on stage and um was openly in relationships with women multiple times she was also an amazing duelist so oh. at, at at one point um she got into a duel with three people <laughs> at the same time and won <laughs> against all three of them wow. in a row uh and then, and this was at, this was at like a royal ball who, and they saw her like kiss a woman and they were like, that's indecent. Let's take this outside. And oh. then she beat all of them. <laughs> I love and that. And then went back into the party with blood stains on her jacket and continued dancing with her girlfriend. And. Oh my gosh. I want to hear more about this. <laughs> it's, it's an incredible story. And, wow. um. Yeah, the, there's a YouTube channel called Extra History, which mm. did a, they did a good series on her, which kind of covers the basics. I'm definitely looking more into her. Yeah. That's incredible. So that's your inspiration. Uh-huh. It was, it was also kind of my first exposure to queerness in history. Yeah. Which I think is a very, very important part of history to kind of uncover from years of burying. Yeah. And, uh... Kind of, kind of to recognize that this is not a new thing. Yeah, because I think that a lot of people feel like, you know, it's like a new trend almost to be yeah. queer in this day yeah. and age, but it's like, it's nice to look back and like a woman in the 1600s yeah. like battled people for being, like for yeah. the queerness. Like, uh -huh. I love it that. was, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's insane. There was also in the same time period, that time period is like a queer gold mine. <laughs> Because because of the specific circumstances where the king couldn't do anything do, yeah. without harming his brother, who yeah. was in line <laughs> to be king of Spain and an basically starting a war. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so he um, so there was there was another woman who was actually an outlaw, and she was riding across like multiple provinces, outrunning the law, and. Uh, and this is because she, quote unquote, kidnapped a bride from her suitor oh. <laughs> and, and they ran off together. Oh. <laughs> and and it, it's just like a gay love story of outrunning the law. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Which honestly goals. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I guess I didn't even ask this, but like, what would you label your sexuality as? I, I used the label pan for a while. Uh, just because I'm more attracted to the person mm -hmm. and less to the gender, but there's kind of a trend there 
um, where I am bisexual, a huge preference towards women, but not necessarily excluding men. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. It's just, I'm, I'm attracted to the personality and the actual person, but it's rare to find a male person who I am attracted to. See, we have she, they in common, and it sounds like our sexuality is like on the All same right. wavelength yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks, Elle, for meeting with me and, you know, telling me about your story and all the really cool trivia that you have just, like, buried <laughs> inside of you all the time. Um, you know, I know I'll see you next week at Encircle, so I will hear more about it then. Should we do a mushroom fact before we leave? <laughs> all right. Did you know that mushrooms have uh, categorized over all of the different species over 3,000 different genders? And they all interact in different ways. So every day we are discovering that mushrooms that we thought were completely different species are just different sexes of the same species. So all of the mushrooms that you buy at the store are actually the same species. Oh. And they're just different genders. So the big old portobello mushrooms that you like grill, those are the same as the like small mushrooms that you put on pizza. They're the same species. Oh, weird. And... They're also the same species as a poisonous mushroom, which is a very, it's like a cousin of the destroying angel, which is a mushroom so poisonous, it will melt your liver. <laughs> if you eat it, then the EMTs will know exactly what happened because your liver will be melted. Wow. It's, <laughs> it's same insane. species, just different genders. Same, wow. same species, just different genders. Mushrooms. And I think... I feel like there's a metaphor in there for yeah. queerness, but I am too tired to find it.